Welcome back to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew, and tonight I'd like to welcome an awesome author, an amazing researcher of ancient history, ancient cuneiform writings, Gerald Clark. How are you doing tonight, Gerald? It, I'm doing good, Chris. It's really great to be with you <laughs> on our yes. on our restart. We're gonna we're gonna get it tonight. Yeah. I can just tell. Hopefully tonight we'll be able to get it done. They attacked us last time, so you know, positive vibes tonight. So let's start over. Let's start with your background again. Um, tell us what brought you down this path. Um, well, <clears throat> I guess that path started in about 2002. I I'd never really been interested in history. Um, I was doing some international travel. Um, I got exposed to some people in Turkey that knew a lot about their culture, and I didn't know anything about it. And they knew a lot about us, too. You know, our, we were such a young country to them. that We didn't really have a history that was significant, right? So I, right. I was sitting in this little restaurant, and I, I don't know if I've told the story, but uh, and it was in the hills just north of Bursa, uh, Inigal, Turkey, with my client there and we were working together and we were having dinner and they were talking about some history and I felt about I don't know Chris about like that big because these were important people to me and I realized I wasn't interested in history I was a hardcore engineer at the time <laughs> and it, w it woke me up to start looking at the symbolism and what things mean and you know the first thing I did was went to try to figure out a few things about their culture so I could share it with them next time I was over there so that, you know, I didn't look like somebody who was really not respectful of their, of their conditions, their, their culture, of their history. And that led me to, I guess, looking into writing a book on ancient technology. I was a technologist, so um, one thing led to another, and I realized everybody looks at, you know, Baalbek, Lambadon, with the trilithon stones, or elsewhere where there's large blocks that we can't even move with our modern equipment today and it makes you go huh <laughs> you know we thought we were the penultimate of evolution and we had the smartest and everything we're the most technical well there are things in our culture that we still don't know how to do that they did in past cultures and that as an engineer to me was like okay that's a hard tangible thing <laughs> there's something there some technology that they had that we didn't have and i think a lot of people are curious about that so that kind of got me started and one thing led to another and I ran into all the writings that other people had done about our ancient past and started perusing through that. And I realized, well, if you can find the oldest writing, at least that we have, that doesn't mean it's the oldest. Start from there and see, you know, what they had to say from their perspective. Get it firsthand, not through filtered through culture. And that led me to um, the Sumer documents, the cuneiform documents. And the reason that happened is I was... Uh, exposed to George Smith and his writings early on in my research and realized this guy in 1870 or so was a preeminent archaeologist at the British Museum, was traveling back and forth to Iraq, this ancient area where they were finding this stuff. And, and uh, I was fascinated by the story that he had told, finding this little dog biscuit and realizing it told the pre-flood story that led to his book called Al uh, the Chaldean Genesis and Chaldea was the biblical area of Iraq today so and when he wrote that book it, it was 1871 I believe it was um, it was you know it was fully academic from a the standpoint that I needed to see it from and that led me to go okay well maybe they didn't know everything about translating and all that back in 1871 even though they said they found dictionaries and symbol libraries and all of the things, you know, they didn't find just some scattered records. They found whole libraries of stuff at Ashurbanipal's temple in Nineveh. So, and one thing led to another, and I started getting really drawn into that story because there was a nugget of truth there for me. And it made me start looking into whether what the Sumerians wrote could possibly be true, even though we treated it as a myth. Right. Like we do the Greeks and everyone else. Right. <laughs> There's what we believe. And then the people that we conquered, what they believe was a myth. Right. That's how it is. Yeah. And so uh, I guess in about 2002 or so, I seriously started um, sitting down and gathering some research. And I started putting it together. And by 2004, I was writing my first book, The Anunnaki of Nibiru. In the background, I was an engineer still involved in venture uh, funded firms you know where the there are board meetings and other um, constraints that don't really allow you to ever talk about 
things outside of business for, for real, you know, I mean, some people would flippantly talk about it, but one, for instance, <laughs> I was working, so you know the scenario. Number one, uh, about 2004, the Ancient Alien series had not come out yet. Remember that? In two, that came out in 2009. Oh, yeah. And so they weren't really talking about the honor. They, they were the only couple of people that were, were really getting lambasted about this point. And it was kind of a dangerous thing to talk about. <laughs> Funny thing, Chris, I was, I know I'm being kind of, monologue-ish here, but I was at a restaurant in San Diego the first time I realized there were other people who thought about this crazy stuff other than me. <clears throat> and I was at this, and it turned out to be, it wasn't anybody from my company. It was a sales uh, salesman for one of the tech products that we used in design software was visiting me at lunch because, you know, they, they, I was part of their account. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so I had a scribed out genealogy table on, I don't know, the paper was about, uh, about this wide. And it was like cardboard, you know, pretty firm paper. And I had taped together about six session, sections of it when I was putting together all these names from the Sumer account. And I had this thing tucked up, folded up in my um, carry bag that, you know, you run around with an engineer like that or your little shoulder bag. And I had it in there and just out of the blue, and I wasn't talking about this at all this guy started talking about something about our ancient history and what he discovered and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at him and I was like, wow, I can't believe this conversation's happening. You know, it wasn't on the job site. It was out at a restaurant close by where everybody went to lunch. And I pulled that genealogy table out. I said, you know, I've been thinking about this stuff too. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to write a book. <laughs> that was the first time it ever occurred to me that that's what I was doing. And it I just got to love those amazing synchronicities. Right. So it just, it just pulled, it just pulled me in. Like, um, I didn't decide that that's what I wanted to do. It just, it just happened that way. Right. So as I got deep into researching the Anunnaki of Nibiru, I realized that <clears throat> the stuff in there affected what we were experiencing in our modern culture and control structures. And it went way back in the past, you know, and everybody's like, Whoa, are the Anunnaki coming back? And I was like, <laughs> in my head, I'm like, do you think they ever left? <laughs> you know, what makes you think they left? Who told you that? You know, like that. Um, so it was, uh, and that book, I think, basically led people to the research themselves with the seminal documents that I pointed out. And those are still in existence today. They're, they're in museums in tablet form and it's a cuneiform that's available at uh, even the Oxford Online uh, University has their versions of it there. So um, so I started there because of, I was worried about translation stuff, right? And speaking of that, um, somebody asked me just today, you know, did you learn to read any of the symbols? And I said, well, of course I did. You know, did I yeah. memorize all of them, you know, and make that a language? No, because there's no one else that speaks it. Who are you going to talk to, <laughs> right? You know, like that. Well, there's actually, there are a couple people who, who do uh, still speak and can read cuneiform. And one of them was the ex-curator of the British Museum. Uh, Irving Finkelstein, <laughs> very animated character, very brilliant, and he teaches people how to read cuneiform and uh, runs little classes online on YouTube. It's really, really kind of cool to see this. And um, so I found these documents from the University of Pennsylvania dated 1902, where a German researcher had decided his graduate work was going to be in um, Sumerian studies, right? So one of his tasks was, uh, and he must, I don't know if he got to go or how it worked out, but they actually went to Babylon, brought back about 120 um, images, the, not the tablets themselves, images, high quality images that they could then take and decode. And so his PhD research was to decode several of the tablets. And I, I had his document, I, you know, it's a, a thesis document. And it was at least three inches thick. And I, I got this and I was reading through it, saw how he decoded cuneiform and they had all his notes there on all of And at that point, something struck me. It was like, not only is this real, but there are real people, you know, who are studying this language and, and f have figured this out, not only way back in 1870, but they were still doing it in the turn of the century. But then, up, uh, you know, and then about 1950, there was a book called Hamlet's Mill came out. Did you ever hear about that one? And it talks no, about and it talks about Nibiru and Sumer and the whole thing. And it was really fascinating. But, but there was a quiet period where there wasn't much said from like the 1950s up until, I don't know, 
around the time of Eric von Donneken's period with uh, Chariot of the Gods. Remember that one? So it was very, he was one yes. of the early, early ones that was talking about this. So, so you know, it, it drew me in. Uh, how, well, how did you get drawn to this topic? Because it's, it's a very popular talk, topic to talk about now. But there, are a lot, but there are a lot of people that don't realize how they got on this path either. Yeah, I mean, I, I was interested just because I knew I started seeing that there was a world behind the world that we see every day. And it just drew me uh, further and further into our history. And I always felt that there was so much more to us as humans uh, than just, you know, like you say, this the meat suit that we are, you know. Um, I always felt that we were meant for so much more in our lives. And, you know, I, I always figured to, to find out where we're going, we need to know where we come from. That's a pretty... And, you know, I, well, oh, yeah, that. I'd like to know, you know, based on your research, where do we come from? Where, where are our beginnings? Well, it's a hard place to say. If you, if you localize us to our particular instance in time on a particular piece of terrain on a planet, I can tell you what we've been exposed to. Is that the whole truth? I can't say, Chris, because there's so much evidence that the, the tiny bit of a fraction of what we knew is so wrong that uh, it's, it, you, know, you want to throw everything out and start over. But the reality is from the, I don't know, the, the out of place objects that we found on the earth and such, a uh, short story is I think mankind is in, in various genetic forms has been on this planet for millions of years. So that's, that's what the evidence shows. <clears throat> but if we want to talk about our particular story as it relates to a particular circumstance like the Sumerians knew in South Africa, That'd be a that, good place that to would, that's a good place to start because um, we can go visit where those sites are. We have their records firsthand. And whether it's true or not, this is what they said, and this is what they believed, okay? And that's why it's good to go to their records in the culture and find this out. And, and in their records, this is not Gerald Clark saying this, in their records, in a particular, um, the Atrahasis talks about mining in the South African region and apparently that's been correlated with the Sumerians King's List and such, which is hundreds of thousands of years old, to a place where they were, you know, gathering gold around the, the, uh, the Zambezi River. <laughs> and we know there are thousands of mines down there. I mean, go, go watch the movie King Solomon's Mines. You can think that yeah. <laughs> there was a gold there. Well, who was mining it 100,000 years ago? And I stopped in my tracks and asked myself that question. Chris, as a person who's been told, yeah, you know, Sumer's 3,800 BC and Egypt's 3,100 BC. And, and then, you know, and the timetable just started going back and back and back to the point yeah. where, you know, even if you were completely inculcated into the religious belief systems of many cultures, e even the Christians believe, well, God created the world in seven days, 4,000 years ago. That was a common belief for a long time, right? And so, right. so all of a sudden, you know, all of this Cultural, cultural lies and morass is lifting the veil with physical evidence that, you know, is repeatable all around the world. So you're forced to face the truth, ultimately. And, and one of those truths is that maybe the Sumerians, who said that a race of um, very advanced beings that were visiting the earth, um, created them through a, a genetic hybrid experience, experiment in South Africa in order to replace miners who they had already working. And this is exactly what it says in the Atrahasis account. And they name names and they name people on the councils. And the bottom line is they messed around with genetics. They were very advanced. And this isn't the first time they've done this in the colonization of another planet to create a hybrid force to work for them. We just happen to be just now, Chris, figuring out that we are the indigenous population that was invaded by an advanced species like what happened in every encounter in guns germs and steel by professor diamond when advanced meets primitive you know the relationships get formed and if somebody's on the outside looking in they would go well you enslave them okay right so it was slavery so this brings up a really really strong issue for us imagine you wake up and you're in this terrain model playing some game, right? Like in the Hunger Games. And all of a sudden you find the boundary of the fence where you can't go out anymore, 
right? That's your boundary. That's your limit. You thought you were free inside this cage or this thing, this thing you called life, the simulator, until you found that edge and you realized you've been herded in there like a sheep. And as long as you think you're free, you'll act like you are, even though you're being used for a purpose beyond yourself, like a pawn. Okay. Well, that's exactly the situation for mankind. And many movies have pointed that out. Well, if you think about back to this idea of hybridization, I want to talk a little bit about that. In yeah. the in the threat briefing report that I posted on my YouTube channel, and not only the report, but the analysis, it was very clear that the Anunnaki, who the Sumerians claimed did all of this, um, didn't originally come from a place where we thought they did. They, they had a long history through the galaxy with other races and through other wars and occupy a sector of the, I don't know, our galaxy that's not just Nibiru, okay? They apparently are part of the Alpha Draconis Alliance and they have relationships with other <laughs> alien beings that uh, are also here on this planet that they work with, okay? So there's hierarchies of aliens way above us and we are the dumbed down, hybridized slave workers that replaced the Ajiji miners in South Africa. And we have genetic evidence of this, about the genetic Eve and genetic Adam study pointed to South Africa approximately 200,000 years ago where the Y chromosome mutation and the X chromosome or the mitochondrial DNA and the X chromosome decay functions, they, they know what those are over time. And it led right back to not only the same place in South Africa, but approximately the same time as what the Sumerians claimed that the Anunnaki created these hybrid beings in South Africa, which they knew was them. And they, they knew they were created to serve the Anunnaki and had no problem with that. You know, I'm sure there were outliers and, <laughs> and revolutionists and all that, but for the most part, the entire civilization was set up to serve them in the central ziggurat temples that every city had. That is fascinating. Now, mm -hmm. these are just, they, you know, that being said, they have different races, but these are just advanced humans uh, or, you know, humanoids. Well, they're, according to the, there's two sources I have for this, of the number of kind of races that have been here. And this, listen, I wasn't thinking about that when I was thinking about the Anunnaki. I mean, they kind of, all their depictions of the Anunnaki in the, in the museum of Baghdad and all that, you know, they, they look very humanoid, you know, bipedal and, and, and symmetrical along a, a vertical plane. So, you know, two sides are symmetrical, two arms, you know, same number of fingers. Some of the, some of the beings were shown as having six fingers, but even the picture behind you on that one showing, uh, it looks like Anki sitting there seated in that picture behind you. Um, yes. If you count their fingers, they had the same number of fingers, toes. You know, they looked a lot like us. They, yes, they were bigger, but they looked a lot like us. But in these other alien, in these uh, threat briefing report, and this is a document that's also available that I put in the link, and it's, it's massive. It's hundreds of pages long. There, according to them, there were more than... 50 races that have visited this earth and of those many of them had a policy that they don't impede with the indigenous population they don't interact with them They're, it's just kind of a galactic rule you, you can't you can't mess with the indigenous right the indigenous <laughs> well other ones don't respect that and yeah uh, and according to this document there were six of those races that were having direct interactions with mankind uh, through their governments and such. And three of them were very hostile to mankind. Okay. So some of them were benevolent toward us and they didn't want to see us wiped out or, or bad, you know, come to us. Whereas the other ones were more about, you know, it's like that movie um, Jupiter Ascending where they viewed yeah. the earth as a resource to be mined and the, and every body, every bodies and body parts were included in that. Okay, and that's the mortifying part about our situation is that's never changed. That's true. There are apparently large value dollars put on eyes and organs and things that perhaps another alien needs to be able to interact with this environment. So those are big time on their market. So we're on the list. We're part of their business. Okay, and that's where it gets very frightening. So I'll summarize what I know from the threat briefing report. In there, 
Um, the Anunnaki started in the Lyra constellation during the Lyran Wars, and they were considered kind of Nordic looking, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, they looked a lot like the, what we call the Nordics now. Well, they eventually migrated um, through this war. So, well, some of them landed on Nibiru, some of them landed in this Alpha Draconis complex, and they apparently had Cygnus and uh, Orion and Sirius too. They, they occupied those as well. So you see these alignments of the, the Giza complex with the stars, right? And everybody thought it was Orion. Well, go check again. It's Cygnus. It's a, it, Orion's pretty close, but Cygnus is exact. Anyway, so they say they came from there. Okay, go ahead. No, so these, these entities that you say uh, kind of broke the... Um I guess the rule and interacted with humans were these the ones that were worshiped as gods through the ages? Some of them were. Yeah. Some of them never really wanted themselves worshiped as gods. It's like the range of experience of, of humanity. You know, there's a lot of people that have the Caesar, Caesar complex where overweening and pride and ambition are the way to live where, you know, other ones were more, I don't know, ascended. Okay. And these, these beings were from a higher dimensional experience and we are a different density if you will another and also their gravity apparently was different than ours okay so and i did a series on gravity i want to get in what that is but imagine you created a hybrid species and you didn't factor in the exact effects of gravity correctly such that the dna could adapt and the being could be whatever orientation it needed to be in the three-dimensional space and for us Bipedalism is kind of unusual, right? If you look at the animal kingdom, there's only a few <laughs> that do that. You know, some, some certain uh, monkeys occasionally stand upright and things, but we're one of the few species that, that does that. And if you think about, from a gravity standpoint, what's required to overcome that in our physical bodies, um, and this is this what really shocked me, Chris, is there are places in your body that will never allow you to be aligned in the gravity field correctly, the way you're designed from birth. Okay, this is like, wow, really? So was there some genetic issue in factoring in our adaptation to the gravity field versus what they had? Because they contributed part of their DNA to this, what we believe was a Neanderthal in South Africa by in vitro fertilizing the ov the egg of the female and um, Enki's half-sister, Ninma, actually carried it to term. Okay, this is from the Atrahasis, what people want to know. And that's spelled A-T-R-A-H-A-S-I-S. I tell people to read that firsthand. Don't, don't take the word about from somebody else about that. It's not that long. There's 11 tablets in there. Read the first one. If you can get past the first one without having your God smell com spell oh. completely smashed, um, then, you, then you didn't read it very well <laughs> or you don't understand what it said. Okay. Yeah. So that was the, the mortifying part is, and this is where the Chaldean Genesis helped. And also uh, in Genesis of the Bible, when you make the correlations to the Bible, because that's what people are used to, with the Sumer documents, their head starts spinning. For instance, in the Atrahasis, it says after um, 600 years, when the king of the city of Sherupak, who we in our Bible called Noah, when that happened, that's when the flood came. And he has not only a couple of snippets like you get in Genesis, there's a whole set of tablets that described every single action that happened and why it happened and what was going on. That account is absolutely mortifying, Chris. I mean, yes, you could find out today that perhaps some nefarious agents that were running PSYOPs committed 9-11 since it was yesterday, memorializing that. And, yeah. uh, and my condolences to everyone that was affected by that. Definitely. Okay. But when those people found out that this wasn't an accident, that it wasn't what they were told, that there were insiders that did this and they lose confidence in the people that are governing them. Well, that's horrible. Okay. And it happened a long time ago in 2001, right? Well, imagine you're a civilization that's been spawned by these Anunnaki. You're slaving away in the mines and so on. And so on. after 600 years, there's so many of you that uh, they decide to get rid of you. I mean, think about that right now, okay? In 600, in, in 200 years of U.S. history, they've produced, what, what do we have, a population? 300 million or so? Yeah. Minus all the people that have died, you know, in wars and all the, the blah, blah. Okay, 300 million. How many could you have in 600 years? 
See what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and yeah, they probably didn't live as long, blah, 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 but they still, they also didn't have family planning things like we have now. So they could have had a lot of people in 600 years from this hybrid experiment is what I talk about. And so when you read in there that uh, one of the highest ranking ones was tired of the noise that they were causing, noisy uh, hybrids that we created with lower consciousness, he complained about them being outside his temple, drinking out of the puddles on the ground like animals. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> These are how the hybrids were acting according to, you know, this being on the council. And that activity, or that, that uh, dissatisfaction with this hybrid um, led to the Anunnaki calling a council meeting in the Atrahasis account. This isn't according to Gerald Clark, that's what it says. And they decided they were going to replace their miners in, inside the gold mines with these hybrid beings that they had created. And so ultimately, they, some of them got brought up to Mesopotamia to be in Enlil's territory. That's where his area was. And he was the one complaining about them making, making noise. And so when they got this council gathered and decided, okay, um, we're, we're, we got to call this population. As a matter of fact, Enlil didn't want, I don't think he wanted any of them ever. You know, he didn't want this genetic species that his brother had created, c contributed his DNA to, to be a preeminent force that could threaten him. I think, as a commander, that would be what I would think. D did you right. Did you have something you wanted to say? Oh no, I was going to say that. I mean, and we've seen. It seems a lot of these, uh, what you would say, resets over our history, uh, where great cataclysms just pretty much wiped out everything and, and mm -hmm. lost all the uh, evidence of what was previously happened. Yeah, I'll just throw something down on you real quick here. Solon, after meeting the priest in Sais from Greece, when he was the, they told him there were many floods, four major ones and many minor ones. Well, if you fast forward to the threat briefing report, in that account, it talks about the colonizers wiping out their genetic experiment seven times, Chris, complete wipe out okay wow. so this is this is mortifying to know that that's a possibility for a species like us this could be the end for you know chimera chimera version number 3.416 i don't know you know what i'm saying right exactly so so anyway that 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 was heavy to process early on finding out that a the bible had bar been borrowed from the sumer docs in large part and and misconstrued as well to you know promote which of the gods they were worshiping the ones in mesopotamia since they were there were the you know <laughs> they ended up being the ones that showed up in the bible okay so you have yahweh and uh um uh bel bel uh, moloch or marduk okay and then you had adonai and you had uh, Enoch, all these characters that you turn out, there's a cross correlation with the Sumer docs with who they really are. Okay. Right. And, um, you know, I was going to ask you about some of the key players in this, uh, you know, maybe from the original names onto what we saw uh, later on, maybe throughout uh, Egyptian mythology and so forth. Yeah, I would just say I can do that. And as soon as you get past Greece, Rome, and into uh, our more modern era, and you start going, oh my God, they were there, there, they were this place here. It, that means they're still, where are their symbols? Oh, they're still here. They're still running things. So when you start getting to that place, that's when your network starts going bad and stuff. Okay? And we so, will definitely so, get to that next. I, that's so on my list. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so let's do a, a little name thing. And I want to encourage people yeah. to look at a genealogy table because you hear these names. They're not normal names that you pronounce and use in the in our modern language. And so uh, they don't ring a bell, okay? But if you tell them in a name of what they were used in a particular culture, they go, oh yeah, I know that one. But they still don't get that these names came from earlier times and they didn't have the same lifespans that we had. This is hard for people to grasp, okay? I yeah. mean, in the Greek, uh, in the Greek uh, mythos, the gods were immortal, okay? And many other ones as well. Well, what does that mean, immortal relative to us? Because we only live maybe 100 years at max, okay? They said they made our DNA so we could maximally live only 120 years. That's what's in the Sumer docs. Well, guess what? That's in the Bible, too. If you read in Genesis, it talks about 
man, blah, blah, blah. And they live a hundred maximum of 120 years. Well, they programmed our telomerase to de have a decay function so that our genetic material decays and we only last 120 years. But what if that wasn't the case and your telomerase never caused shortening of your telomeres? You would not age. That's, that's physical science, and the, there was a Nobel Peace Prize issued in 2009 to three scientists who discovered that. So look up telomeres if you don't believe that these beings could live a long time. And also in the Sumerian Kings list, many of them lived. Yeah, I was just about to say that. The Kings list, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And Yeah, well, people talk about that. It's very interesting if you really study that Kings list. The before their great flood, okay, and I tried to correlate that with the flood that they talk about in the bible this one looks like it was different than the one remember we were four major ones okay meaning it probably covered practically the whole surface of the earth well they they had one in their account in the sumerian kings list and it was right at i think it was right before gilgamesh as i remember uh, no i have to go look again but the first nine sumerian kings started by them saying and we're going to you know kingship is going to be lowered from heaven to earth well all of a sudden you're going Heaven? What do you, you guys call your home planet heaven? Where did we get that term? Right there, <laughs> right? And yeah. Anu, Anu, their king, Anuburu, had decided to allow kingship to be brought to the earth. And in the Sumerian kings list, on it starts there and talks about the very first one and where he landed. His name was Alulim, and he was the king of where? The same city that Enki founded, Eridu. Uh, they call it Eridug in the documents, but it was Eridu. Okay. Eridu was Enki's city originally at the Tiger where the Tigris and Euphrates meet and dump into the Persian Gulf right there. Okay. So that was the, one of the oldest outposts that the Anunnaki created, the first one here on earth. And we believe that one was about almost 400,000 years old, according to the records. So if you look at the Sumerian Kings list, the first several of them before the flood, before it was disrupted, they all served terms that are stated as shars. Right, you see that in the document, and this is the one directly from Barassas that I got from the Library of Congress. So I had some trust in it that it was real. Okay, but it is real, and what Barassas wrote is basically correct. He gives you a lineage of those Sumerian kings that also tie into major characters that show up in the Bible, like Nimrod or Gilgamesh. Right. So this right. people know those names, uh, but they don't realize that <laughs> in the Sumer documents, these guys were. We're full on. So let's name a few of them to just correlate what happened. Right. So in that account, on Anunnaki are really upset. He, these hybrids they made are making all this noise, and the Atrahasis says 600 years has passed. There's probably a multitude. He introduces two diseases to try to wipe them out. They're just horrific if you read about what he did. Cut off the food, cut off the water, started decimating the humans to the point after six years they were eating each other and selling their kids in the market. That's what it says. That's disgusting. But that's yeah, what it says. And after that, after all of that punishment and abuse brought by the Anunnaki Council to get rid of these hybrids, uh, apparently they knew a natural event was coming that would cause another great flood. And time to them is very different than it is for us. So one year for them is 3,600 years to us, according to their scale. Okay, So a shower is 3,600 years. And their kingship terms on the king's list were recorded in shars. So you can look at that and see if that's exactly the case. So um, he knew, so Enlil and their count, Enlil's the top dog on earth because Anu is father and Enki is father. Enki's father is on Nibiru, okay? Even though he visited a few times in the accounts, okay? And he had a temple in Sumer, the white temple of Anu in the city of Ur Uruk, for instance, where Gilgamesh was king, was Anu's temple, okay? When he came to visit. So we had Anu the father, we had Enki, the firstborn son, the scientist. We had Enlil, the secondborn son of his of his uh, half sister. Okay, his half sister's name was Ki Arash Anus. The, that offspring meant because of their rules, they uh, he was in line to rule. So Enlil was the younger brother, even though he was the, ended up being the commander. Okay, so Enki came to the earth first about 450,000 years ago, looking for materials and resources and other planets to colonize, right? If you read the Enuma Elish, okay, it talks about the Tablets of Destiny. These belong to Enki, okay? They were on the planet Tiamut before the, their constellation had a collision with what became our Earth and our moon, Kingu. 
Well, if those tablets of destiny were on that Tiamat planet, which is where our, our proximity our Earth, they were already starting to colonize the inner planets and were watching stuff. Okay, so so the idea that they came back to a planet that reaggregated and became our Earth, where the planet or where the tablets of destiny belonging to Enki uh, were held, uh, that that goes back to the Sumer docs as, as well, because Enki was the holder of these civilizing tablets. Maybe they were optical discs that run on Blu-ray. I don't know, Chris. Yeah. But yeah. They, they had the aspects for rolling out civilization to civilize places, okay? And he was in control of those. So there's a direct connection with Enki and the Tablets of Destiny and our destiny because of that. So Anu, Enki, and let's not leave out Ninma, okay? Uh, she was the medical officer. I know we just turned red there for a second. Are we okay? Can you hear? Yeah, we're, so, we're good so far. Okay. So those three key players... Enki and Enel, and, and she's the half-sister to both of them. Okay, this is the key, and she shows up as the medical officer in the Sumer documents that came to the Earth to provide medical and health support for the people that were here. Okay, and she ended up setting up her operation in the same city where uh, Atrahasis was, in the city of Sharupak. So that's where the medical outpatient clinic was, right there. Okay, that was her area. So she was in Levant as, as well. She was key, okay, uh, in these Sumer documents. Those three in particular, Marduk is mentioned a little bit, and Ninurta, some of the other kids are mentioned, but let's focus on the three main ones. Enki, the scientist and creator. Enlil, the commander, slash, he, and he's, the, he's got a rank of 50 on the council. Okay? Enki's 40, and it goes on down to, all the way down. So you got 12 people on there. The even-numbered okay. ones are male, and the odd ones are female. So 60 was Anu, 55 was Antu, his wife. Those were known as Gab and Nut in Egypt, by the way, those two, just to start correlating. Anki was uh, number 40, his rank at the time that we had these documents, and Enel was 50, and their spouses were the intermediate numbers. So uh, Ninki was Anki's wife, so she would have been 35. He was 40. 45 was Ninlil or Sud, who was Enlil's wife, okay, and up the line. So these are the highest ranking ones on the council. Okay, we can talk about all the other ones too, but these are the ones that are, you know, essentially setting the direction of the council decisions, right? Okay, so, so we have Enki and his sister Ninma that were ordered by the council to go create a hybrid replacement. So I focused in on those two because if that's the case, then the DNA that we have came through at least partially from them, okay? So it's worth knowing that. I mean, it's like if you were to go get a genetic test today and say, well, who's my father, right, or like that? Well, the reality is I focused on the Anunnaki. Even though there's these other races, they put their genetic mark on us, and that's exactly what the Bible says. You know, we created in our image and our likeness. Well, that's <laughs> – we are hybrid Anunnaki, whether we know it or not, and we are created in the likeness of them. Okay, not some reptilian-looking thing or anything else. We were created in the likeness of them. And that picture directly behind you with Anki sitting there? Yes. His DNA is who you were created after the likeness of. And and, Nin, and Ninma, who is known as Belet Ili, the womb goddess, known as Isis in Egypt, okay? She had many, many names, okay? But she is a key seminal character because she was the half-sister to both of them, meaning she could produce the offspring kings, that would be on the throne. You had to be, have an offspring from your half sister in order for this to be real, not your wife. That's their rules. And it had to do with preservation of mitochondrial DNA, <clears throat> which the female contributes in the, in the process. Now it seems that, um, it seems that of the two brothers, Inlo and Inki, that Inki seems to be the more compassionate. Would you, would you agree with that? Inki was Prometheus. So when you see that movie that, you know, he realized what circumstance, you know, and, and yes, he may have been, and I wrote about this in my screenplay, about what, by the way, this is a really deep issue. What is the, our genetic creator's relationship to us? Now, let's, let's play a little mind game, Chris. <clears throat> if you knew the scientist who first genetically caused a cloning of Dolly the sheep, and he actually did it to a human, and that human was you, and you grew up and found that out, <clears throat> And found out, well, he's done, he's done this for millions of other people too, not just me. So, um, so I got a, I got a daddy complex now because, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it, it created yeah. me. It doesn't even care. 
right? Or it doesn't seem yeah. to. That's the thing. You know, this is the this is the thing we project onto the Anunnaki, by the way, with all these archetypes. And so, um, would you would you worship this being like the Sumerians did and go, well, that's it created us, so we got to serve them, bring them food, bathe them, clothe them, do whatever they want, right? Like they did then. Or, you know. You know, you're kind of in a, a quandary on how to deal with this. Now, now, for instance, if you found out this this scientist who did Dolly the sheep was the one who created you, and you and you're, you you know, at this point, would you go? Um, I really hate you for what you did to me. You know, you gave me a genetic hybrid that's a subset of your DNA. I'm not full on. You know, I I you know, and at this point, it's like the the Native American discussion of the rabbit. And the hare, or then the tortoise, having a discussion about, well, you were made so capable in your past. So we start comparing, right? Well, I don't have the IQ that you do. All this stuff that comes up, and and this created a real mental issue for me in realizing that you could you could play victim and go, well, we were enslaved, we were treated to this and da da da. But at the same time, this is where it gets really deep, Chris, is the concept of what we term slavery. Okay, and Anki wrote some about this because he um, knew that galactically jump-starting a species by millions of years and putting their mark on them um, has some uh, consequences relative to the development of consciousness that is universal, not just in our species. Okay, we're all on a path back to discovery of who the source is and where we are. And you opened this discussion about saying essentially that we're all on a truth quest when you find out what's really going on. Because if you're not half crazed in the head and realizing that everything you've been told is a lie and you want to know the truth, you haven't figured it out yet. That or you've stuck your head in the sand and you don't want to know. And you've yeah. decided to live in the matrix because it's comfortable. And listen, there's no one that says you need to be pulled out of the matrix and woken up, right? If you're entertained by that and it's not your time to wake up, then have at it, okay? Because we're all, we're all eventually on this path back to the source. And this comes from their writings as well. Also the writings from one of the key players that I left out, who was the other scientist and son of Enki, who was Ningshita Thoth. Ningshita shows up in the accounts, and actually he was a geneticist as well, that apparently was involved in doing the upgrade to the, the first two beings that they created, the Adapa, and the, we call them Adam and Eve, gave them a genetic upgrade so they could procreate. They couldn't procreate as a hybrid when it first when they first made them. This was a real problem. They're trying to meet labor requirements, right? So I was like, oh, we just made them, and now they can't reproduce. What are we going to do? Build them in the lab, you know, so many at a time. You know, they tried that for a while, too, and it didn't it didn't work. So this Ninshita Thoth character is quite amazing. He turned out to be quite an inspiration to me when I realized there were benevolent ones here that were – in affiliation with forces that were much higher than the Anunnaki. Okay, the Anunnaki is a race. I mean, imagine you go up to the place where, you know, there, and, and it's been mentioned in some of their writings from Thoth that there are civilizations on other planets that have actually evolved to the place where they don't need to toil. They create everything from thought and manifest it for their reality. Now, wouldn't that be a nice place to be, <laughs> right? But there, there are ones that are that far along in the evolutionary path, uh, much further than we are. So, so this concept of slavery, I want you to tell me what your thoughts about are when you discovered that possibly what the Sumerians are saying is true and that it applies to you. Well, in, go ahead. That's, that's very interesting that you say that because I was just thinking about that as you were speaking. Um, I mean, I, the more you look into it, basically everything that, we, that we've learned in our history is a lie. Um, our politics is not real. The, le, uh, you know, right wing, left wing, it's, it's all under the same control. And I started seeing this control in everything, in the food we eat, in the air we breathe, in the shows we watch on TV. And it, it just became more and more obvious that there was... There was this underlying control. And it's funny that you said matrix because, you know, it does feel like we are in some kind of matrix. And I want to ask you about the construction of this. And was this always what we were designed to be in? 
is this sort of prison planet matrix? Well, you, you bring up a, a really interesting question. And this comes from some of the writings um, from John Peniel in The Lost Teachings of Atlantis, by the way. So this isn't from Gerald Clark making this up, okay? I, I, as a scientist in jail, I usually give you a reference where I found this, okay? Now, you can go look at it yourself and decide if it's true. In The Lost Teachings of Atlantis, there was a history of Atlantis given by John Peniel from his master teacher in a Tibetan monastery, okay? <clears throat> This goes way back, and there's only a few of these in the world, and they don't talk about this. And this is a, a really great history, and it correlated a lot with the history from Thoth in the Emerald Tablets and several other locations about what really happened. What, how did this enslavement really get started here on this planet? Apparently it goes yeah. back a long time, a long, long time. So in that story, and I'm going to try to summarize this the best I can, and I think it's important to know this because of the dimensional boundaries and everything that gets crossed here. Apparently, there were beings uh, that were affiliated with Thoth's group long before Atlantis when they came here. And they were uh, so advanced that they didn't even have to take on a form, a body form, unless they wanted to. And part of their trip was going to different dimensions and times and locations and trying on the material forms of what they could instantiate there to have that experience. They were having, I don't know, kind of like a VR virtual reality experience like we try to do in games and such. They were doing this by having material instances of themselves show up on various planets. The, the ones that came to the earth and did that took on various forms according to this writing. They took on animal forms and all different kinds of forms, okay? And their consciousness could be in that, even though they looked like an animal, they were actually a very advanced being just having that experience in that form. What they didn't count on was by materializing into a, a, a certain dimension as that form that they would get possibly entrapped in that form and could not get back to the place where they were not uh, an instance of material. Okay, So back to the source place where they were. They didn't know and they're dabbling that this could happen, okay? So apparently, the first wave of these beings that Thoth talks about in the history, and Thoth was the master, by the master teacher to this Atlantean monastery, according to their records. And his last incarnation to them before Babaji was Jesus. They call him the same being, and I totally agree in my genealogy table. So, so for those of you who want to know, I believe that Thoth Nikshita is the Jesus archetype, and he was more than... I don't know, probably 500 <laughs> archetypes and incarnations in our experience when, it, when you look in the uh, incarnations of the Buddha. He's talking about 500 of them. Well, you know, Thoth talks about descending into the halls of Manti over a thousand times to reincarnate to be here in this experience for us every hundred years. So I was like, okay, well, maybe that's true, right? <laughs> right, and, and so Thoth is essentially here to help us, you know, sort of escape this matrix in a way right or at so, least awake what you know we well, let me let me continue that crazy story so in that process the second wave came to try to rescue the ones that got trapped in form and couldn't get back to because they they were like well they are us even though we could you know let them have their karma for what they did but we can't stand by and let this happen so they came to find those beings that were trapped in form and then they gave them the choice whether to become back to what they were or to stay, okay? And, and for the ones that they could find, it was the problem. And uh, so there was a whole search team from the domain forces that came to the earth to find these beings that were trapped in form to rescue them. And this is where a really crazy correlation came in from the uh, Roswell inter alien interview where the nurse that had that, that discussion with this being called Errol described Ahura Mazda as the one who was an incarnation of Enki, okay, who came as part of the domain forces to find the beings that were trapped in those forms and rescue them with his flower of life detector that he was holding in his hand that looked like a pine cone, okay? So he was here to, as part of that second wave, apparently, uh, having an incarnation here because, he, you know, he was here way before as well. Okay, as Anki in, in South Africa. So all of a sudden, here he is in incarnation where he's still doing this mission of trying to find his 
relatives or domain affiliates, whatever you want to call them, that are trapped in material form. Well, guess what? The ones, there are beings that are still trapped in the material form. They used to be chimeras, you know, the, the minotaurs and all that. Those were real beings that apparently these highly advanced beings tried to take on the form of. They didn't want to just be a bull or this. They wanted to try an experiment of a hybridization, right? So those were real. Those ancient <laughs> discussions of hybrid chimeras was real. And well, yeah. at some point they rounded up several of them and apparently the, the culmination of it happened sometime in the region we call Egypt now, okay, where Thoth was sent from Atlanta. Well, they, there were still beings that are trapped in the forest. And ultimately, um, he called them the human animals. Well, and when you realize in that story what he's talking about, we are them. We are the human animals that used to be connected back to the source that have lost our way in materialism, descended down the, the mountain of consciousness to the lowest levels of material wallowing, and we, have for the most part as a species, have forgotten any semblance of where we came from and who we are. And when you ask that question about where did we come from, who we are, we go back to at least a connection with Enki, her Ahura Mazda, Poseidon, whatever name you want to call him, who was a very high-ranking scientist from the Anunnaki that came here and started it all. So that Prometheus story, watch it again, and you'll realize that's the sacrifice he made for us. And this, again, goes back to the idea of slavery. Um, and maybe that's another show because it's very deep when you get into what it is and what we call it and how it looks and what's the way out of it and all of that. Okay. But, but realizing you are um, an indigenous trapped being who is, has a soul that's immortal. Your essence is eternal, just like the essence of the Anunnaki, okay? It's, so you may lose that material anchor that you call your body, your meat modem, in this process and whatever. But you can, you can take on another one like buying a, a used car, according to them, okay? So... It, that you know and knowing that and also having personal experiences with my own energy body and realizing that it exists outside of this meat host and is he immortal it kind of gets you over this fear of death where you can't be as manipulated as easily but for the majority of people chris don't ever overcome their fear of losing this material form in this reality because that's all they have they don't they don't have the connection back to the source so it's it's all they have right and it right. makes sense it makes sense yeah, and that's what I'd like to end on later on tonight is how we can kind of help ourselves awaken and, and get through this process and make ourselves better and possibly see where we can take uh, the human race in the future. But now I'd, I'd like to get into now these, these players, these key players that used to make themselves present to us, that used to have regular, I guess, communication with humans. It seems like that just went underground into some deep secret control. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that transition and what's going on now. Okay, well, let's, let's do that. And then let's take a little nature break in about when, when we get to the end of this one, okay? And then we'll come back sure. and finish up. So in, the, in one of my favorite movies that started talking about the, the controls behind the scene, okay? Well, listen, the Greeks used to call, call their, their controllers the, the gods on the Olympian Council, and they lived up on a real pimp and pad up in the mountains, right? They didn't live down with the people, right? <laughs> they did their puppeteering from up over there, right? Well, the movie Jason and the Argonauts portrays that really well in the early 60s, that one. Um, yeah. Fantastic, you know, where, um, you know, they're, they are showing essentially the, their concept of breaking open the hologram and reaching in and messing with mankind whenever they wanted to, okay? Well, that I find is actually true because imagine the beings that created you did it in such a way where they understood the electromagnetic spectrum. They knew what your brain waves were. They could monitor them using telemetry equipment from remote distances. So they not only knew <laughs> when you were transmitting, they knew every thought you were having because let's think about the term telemetry. That's remote gathering of data. Okay. We do this with um, satellites and things like that, that we can't actually physically be there. We get remote telemetry data from it. How's the health of it? Blah, blah. Well, as a meat modem with five senses that can transmit everything that you perceive and gets turned into a thought, they can monitor that 
and you've never ever had a private thought, even though you think you have, there's nothing private in the electromagnetic universe. So right. your creators have full insight into it. not only what makes you tick, but everything that's going on as your response to the simulation outside. So you think they can't reach in and change some cause so that you get an effect and puppeteer you. As a matter of fact, the extent to which you're not aware of being puppeteered is probably the magnitude of which you're being vectored by forces that you don't even understand. Where do your thoughts come from? Is it just, you know, <laughs> so when you start realizing that thoughts can be put in your head, images can be put in your head over the electromagnetic spectrum through your meat modem, uh, you start questioning, is this my thought? Is this a, and when you finally get to the battleground of thoughts in this process for yourself, where you recognize that you that your brain is a, is a computer that can turn on past and future, but you bring it into the now and it's useless, right? <laughs> where the experience yeah. happens. So these senses are being turned into electrical signals into your brain. This, this, is, this is science, okay? So the idea that we're telemetry meat modems, okay? What, now, now let's give a context so this makes sense. People hate when I use that term, by the way. Okay, modem just, Not means, like that, just it means you're a modulator demodulator. Okay, and there's no electronics involved. It's all being done with meat. This is amazing, okay? Such that you're yeah. communicating over the electromagnetic spectrum and changing waveforms and putting data on them and being able to send it and receive it anywhere in the universe. That's what our modern communications is, okay? Well, you are a agent of the Anunnaki that's put on a colonized planet and everything you see and experience, you're a remote telemetry device for them so that they can use your eyes they can use your senses and find out hey the resources down there how's it going so they didn't need a camera on your head you are the camera you are the smell detector you are the sensation and heat you are the sensor do you see that yeah definitely oh yeah so not only are you can you transmit but you can receive and we've seen this through you know lots of different programs and realize and realize through entrainment and the, all the techniques that can be used with uh, understanding how a human brain is built that you can do this. So, so from that standpoint, all of a sudden um, you realize that uh, there is no privacy. <laughs> okay. So it forces you to become extremely responsible with your thoughts. So if you choose to put your eyes on this and you know, well, that causes me to be all about that, but it's not good for, for me and separating me from my internal energy. And this is the part that people don't get, is if you don't have a connection to gravity, the sensation of your higher energy self, your chakras, this is all woo-woo talk, okay? And it's, it doesn't have any, it doesn't ring true with them, okay? But if, you, but if a person can have an experience such that they know that A, they were awake, and B, that they were conscious and rational, and that they existed apart from this, okay, not just in thought, but in reality. If they could have that, they would know that this is temporary and that this is all a game, that we're infinite beings having material experience, and it would, the game would be over, okay? And, this, and the material lesson simulator would change at that point for that person because they're not going to treat their material the same way because it's like, don't codify it pacify it, try to keep it from aging, all that other stuff. It's a transient material thing. And it's not, it's only a vessel for you to have this experience to evolve your consciousness, which is eternal. So how do you, how do you convince somebody of that? Unless they can distinguish and thought tells you this in Emerald Tablets. If you can distinguish yourself from your not self, then, then you'll be, you're on the pathway to discovering who you really are. Okay not the name you were given, not the job you're doing, not the skills that you have, none of that. That's not who you are. That's, that's what you do. And you think that's who you are because that's your ego response to your perceptions through your sensors. Okay? What you experience is not who you are. Wh who you really are, in essence, from that standpoint, is how you respond to things knowing what you are. So your response is far more important than, <laughs> you know, than anything, because that's where you have an opportunity to exercise your character and your, your learnings. Your, you know, did you learn good to, <laughs> you know, to, to overcome your seven vices, you know? So ultimately, um, I see the, the simulator as a, 
an intentional simulation, a, a holographic reality, if you will. Listen, you can see that now. If you can do this through this controlled media and present it to people, you control the mindset and what they think. Well, that's a that's a that's a a, a, tele, a communicated reality that is virtual that's not real, as well. And if that's got in the hands of a few small people, they're creating the, the simulation reality for the rest of the people. Well, that's no different than what was going on in the Hunger Games in the game room, where the game master was setting out this thing for blah, 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 for the heroes to <laughs> try and create scenarios where they uh, culled themselves because they didn't want to do it, right? The heroes are the ones that raise people up to rebel against the authorities, right? So if you put them in competition to wipe each other out, then, hey, we don't have to do it, right? And that still goes on today, too. <clears throat> yeah, and um, and I want to I want to talk about that. If you want to take a, a quick pause here, yeah, and then yeah, we, can we should come, about, um, we should come the, back uh, to the underground bunker thing, what you were talking about there. <laughs> we should go back to the simulation room just for a minute yeah. before we lose that because there's some good stuff there. Okay. All right. Very good. We'll pause okay. for a minute and we'll come right back. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Okay. All right. All right, well, welcome back. Um, I th we were talking about the control that's going on today. Now, let's get into that a little bit. Um, a little bit how the structure is set up and what, uh, what are we looking at going into the future? Okay, well, this one's gonna take a little bit of a dive back in history and I'm gonna try and do it kind of quick. Cause sure. like I said in the beginning of the show, if you start talking about what's going on now and where they are and blah, 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 uh, <laughs> there's a good reason why I live in the circumstances I do. It wasn't by choice. Okay. Anyway, so let's do, let's do this. Okay. Going back in history to about the time of the pyramid wars. Okay. This is where Marduk in Babylon is stationed and he's not supposed to be there. The son of Enki. He's the firstborn son of Enki. He decided to be in Babylon and set up the gateway to the gods, which meant a space facility inside of Enel's territory, which was given to him by Anu. Okay, this is recorded in the Atrahasis, by the way, which territories were given to Hugh. Enki at Africa, and, and for now, what's important is Enel owned all of Mesopotamia. Even though Enki had his Ridu temple there, he got to keep that, but his, that was not his domain anymore. Marduk, his son, had no business being up there, and they went to war. With, he went to war with Yahweh, Enel. Okay. Yahweh, as you know, was the God of the Torah of the first five books of Moses, okay? And the Jewish nation was recruited by Enlil to be his chosen people to do his bidding, okay? If you basically, and they believe they were the chosen people of God, right? For that reason. Okay. Well, around 2000 BCE in the wars between Enlil and Marduk, Marduk actually prevailed and uh, became the head of the Anunnaki council of rank of 50, and the 50 day names of Marduk were read every spring in Babylon because of that. So he was the top dog on this planet at that time. Okay. And, um, and Yahweh Enlil did not go away. Okay. That, by the way, he was Zeus in Greece and his arch nemesis Poseidon was his half brother Enki. So Enki and Zeus or Poseidon and Zeus were Enki and Enlil. Okay. So let's go back to the Marduk conflict. Okay. So, during so when he rose to ascendancy, um, <clears throat> you realize in the wars between Babylon and Jerusalem that much of the populace, the skilled populace of Jerusalem, was taken captivity in Babylon. And if you count the the duration they were there, um, some people disagree with this, but it's approximately 1,600 years. That's a long time to have exposure to a culture and not take it on. So the priests of the uh, were also taken captivity from Jerusalem into Babylon, where they, for the first time, got exposed to these Sumer documents and the writings of the Anunnaki, from which they created their Hebrew account of the Sumer documents. So that is historically accurate. And for people who want to dig into that side from the religious side and go at it that way versus coming from the Sumer docs leading up to where <laughs> that translation happened, uh, I recommend looking into Moro Bellino's work. And he did uh, a free PDF in English. It was something to the effect of the last book you'll ever read about the Bible was something like that title. Now I have a link to my website for that. Anyway, so the control structure, let's not lose sight of this. Marduk, as his preeminence, basically had it in his mind that he needed to route the um, 
headquarters for Enlil, which used to be Nippur, where they ran their mission control centers and all the aircraft landing and taking off from Sapar, which they called their spaceport. That moved higher to higher ground after one of the floods. And Yahweh Enlil's headquarters became Jerusalem in the documents. Okay. So Enlil <laughs> was there. Well, Marduk, uh, basically through, through time and his, I don't know, strategic plans of having every possibility covered. He's brilliant, by the way. They both, they all are. Anyway, it looks like he found a way to infiltrate uh, the Torah Jews via the, the Khazar region way back in time. This is, uh, if you look, at, look up the history of Khazar, the region in Khazaria where the entire populace converted to Judaism, right? Why did they do that? And you can tell they did it using the Babylonian Talmud. It's in their records. Well, that came from Marduk. So I see that as a long-term strategy by Marduk to move his religious people into Israel and take over under and use the Babylonian Talmud as their preeminent document. Now, tell me that did not happen. That did happen. Okay, so Marduk's money magic that he taught in Babylon to these people that became Jew Jews, even though they never had any blood from the Khazar region with shared with the, the people in the Palestine, Palestine region. Okay, they, they didn't have any Semite blood at all. Well, these became the Jews that are now in charge of the religious order serving Marduk. So Marduk looks like he routed Enlil to me. And because of that, if you look at the control structure and the banking structure and the media and who owns everything in the world, it's the agents of Marduk. And I'm not calling out anybody genetically on this, but that's just what it is. Okay. Right. Okay. You want to see if, if I think about a Rothschild who has $500 trillion and has banks in over 140 countries. You tell me those people are not serving Marduk. Okay. Cause if you look in the Babylonian Talmud where Marduk was the chief deity. Okay. And he's also known as Moloch, Bel Moloch. Okay. So if you look in Palmyra, Syria, where those, Arches were destroyed by ISIS of all people. Why would you name a barbarian force after the mother of humanity? Unless you're disparaging her, okay? So there were factions among the Anunnaki where they did not get along. And when it was time for them to be in preeminence, or anyone else that opposed them, their namesake was smeared, okay? That goes for, that goes for the three that were important in our historical account, Enki, Ninma, and Ningshita Thoth, okay? Ningshita Thoth sh shows up as Enoch in the Book of Enoch, by the way. He was Enoch. And he also <laughs> shows up in the Bible as Azazel when they were talking about sacrificing two goats. One of them was for Yahweh and one was for Azazel who released the goat as a nature atonement. So these were two opposing forces that came into conflict, okay? Enki's son Thoth came into conflict because he was here to promote consciousness and raise the consciousness of these hairy barbarians. Enlil didn't want that. As the commander of the earth, when he was in charge, he wanted slaves to do the functional mission, and he didn't want any peers coming out of that group. Okay? There were no openings in the Anunnaki Council for hybrids that think they're as good as we are. That's how it was. Okay? So that control structure <clears throat> has been on this earth through religion, through government, through all the civilizing factors of humanity from the very beginning, okay? So controlling the media, controlling uh, the perception of reality is how they control the narrative and keep people living in the Hunger Games box thinking they're free when in actuality, they're some of the most dumbed down slaves through history. Now, it, it does seem in the last few years that there is this mass awakening going on, more people are realizing what's happening. And I, you, you hear talk that there may be some kind of underground war going on, uh, you know, the light forces versus these evil ones that are keeping the control. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I noticed something very interesting, Chris, early in my research is they very much, not only did they give us the Zodiac wheel, but they also used it in terms of determining local time in on this planet relative to galactic time and they had 
mathematical correlations between our cycles and theirs in order to establish that. Okay. So they were very, it was very important to them. And it also delineated the term limits for the rulers as well. Okay. So I, you know, I'm the ruler in the age of so-and-so. Well, they were talking about zodiacal ages. Okay. So every zodiacal house change, there's a possibility that you could see, and this is about 2000 years. Okay? If you use the equivalent model, it's 2160, it's 72 degrees times, times 30 degrees in a, in a slice of the house, right? So there's 30 degrees sliced up in 12 segments to create the zodiacal wheel in the equivalence model. But that became an issue between Marduk when he was asserting himself and determining what the right time was in the age, right? So this is the, where the, all the archaeoastronomy comes in. And so there's a, another transit model that's called the, uh, the actual transit, which the Hindus use. So, you know, the, so the zodiacal times can change per house. Well, if that's the case, <clears throat> I did this to go back and see if what Thoth said was true in the Emerald Tablets relative to when he built the, the Giza complex. And he tells you in the history of those tablets that after ruling Egypt for 16,000 years, blah, 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 and they came, he left Atlantis from his father's direction, Anki, 50,000 years ago, you do the math, that was 34,000 years ago, approximately. Well, if you rewind the zodiacal wheel using the non-equivalence house model, you'll land exactly in the house of Leo, right? Which we know the Sphinx is based on a lion and the face on it, he said, was his. Okay. So Ningxia Thoth's face is on the Sphinx in the age of Leo, but it turns out you got to wind it back twice to get there, not 10,500 years, okay, like several people have done. And they've ignored these writings, even though they looked at the erosion on the Sphinx. Well, maybe it's been here longer than 10,000. We don't know. Okay. Well, in the writings, that's what he says. Okay. So let's, let's get back to the control structure. <clears throat> so we're starting to see these factions between the Enlilites and the Enkiites in terms of how they deal with the hybrids that they created. One wanted, uh, wanted them to, you know, do the work, but also knew that they were created from an eternal sun soul spirit that could evolve so they had to take into account this concept of the evolution of consciousness okay and i take you back to the garden of eden where enel and anki were both represented there in the iridu gardens of you know where they where they were experimenting and looking at these two first hybrids to see if they could procreate okay that's where the story came up where anki you know being this wise scientist was saying to one of them, no, if you eat that, it won't kill you. It'll give you an awareness of consciousness like what we have, right? And who decided, no, no, no. <clears throat> Yahweh Enlil, God, the God of Moses, told her, no, if you eat that, you will surely die. Right. right? So one of them was lying. She ate it and she didn't die. She became aware that she was naked, this representative of a reflective consciousness that comes with intelligence, okay? So right. why would you deny that to somebody unless you wanted them to stay a slave and then complain about them being so barbaric and animalistic that they're drinking out of the puddles in front of your temple naked like animals. Okay. So you can't have it both ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so they were in conflict. So I see the entire game, Chris, as the battle over the control over the evolution of the slave hybrid species consciousness. Because as soon as they wake up, like what's happening right now, this conversation we're having right now, if people realize that you're in a slave box and you've been told you were born in the land of the free and the home of the brave all your life to brainwash you and you realize this, that's what causes revolutions. And listen, control structures and governing forces that are using you for skilled labor and adding efficiency numbers to how good you get this and do that. They don't want those because those are very disruptive. And that means, uh, you know, they got to put it down, put down the revolt, right? Over and over and over again. How many times has that happened through history? You know? Yeah. So, so they don't want, so you can't have it both ways. You either have to let them govern themselves as free independent beings, or you keep them dumbed down to where they don't know they're slaves and they, they think they're, you know, they think they're free. And so that's changing right now, isn't it? And why, why is it? Well, in that zodiacal wheel, I calculated the, the age of Pisces, the very beginning of it was 26 AD. Now, if you add the transit time for that house going forward or backwards, you end up at 2012 B BC or 2012 AD, which is the beginning of the age of Aquarius, according to if you use that house model. Well, do you think that's a coincidence that 
Thoth Quetzalcoatl's countdown calendar from 3,114 BC to that date was exactly a Mayan sun count, 5,000, about 5,280 years or whatever it is exactly. I'm doing this from memory. So those two coincident are coincident to this very special age of Aquarius. And that means it was destined for a period for higher consciousness, but at the same time, the control structures that were here that were embedded, well, let's call them the, the old dominion forces. Okay. There's the domain forces that want higher consciousness. And then there's the demiurgus forces under the old commander of the earth. And apparently in alliance with Marduk. Now I think Marduk and Enel have, formed a cooperative agreement okay you get this region i get this region because i know if we go head to head what's going to happen all right so according to that if you want to identify where they are and this came from inky's anonymous message that i posted on my youtube channel and on my website and it does correlate with what's happening is that marduk um, appears to have um taken over europe he, he was clearly running the uh the religious factions in Israel and the government. And so where's, where's Enlil? Well, he was the God of America for a long time, right? Well, until about 1895, it looks like when the Christian God uh, took over the um, highest figure in the Masonic order, whereas it used to be the master architect who was Thoth, who brought the mystery schools to humanity in the first place. And this comes from, the commissioning by Poimander in the uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages from Manly P. Hall. If you read that, you'll see that Thoth was commissioned by higher entity beings. You could call them cycle masters. You could call them whatever to lead humanity through the dark ages until they were at the age of where they were supposed to wake up to their higher consciousness. Because that is part of the creator of all's destiny for their, for their beings and their souls, not their material form, but for their souls is to everyone returns back to the source eventually. Okay, so we're on that path, the Anunnaki are on that path. And so right now it looks like, from what I can tell, a lot of that wake up has to do with either genetic latent circuits that the Anunnaki built into us. And you can look and read about those in my book or you can read, it, read about what Timothy Leary said about our latent DNA circuits. So whoever our geneticists were, built us in a way that didn't ignore the evolution of consciousness. And this was a big problem between Enki and Enlil. They fought about this when Enlil found out about this. So we have in us the constructs to get back to the source from which we came. That energetic form before we took on a material form and got lost in our experience, okay? Some in the bodies now are still what you would say <laughs> domain originals that landed in form that keep reincarnating in the humanimal form, but are actually members of a higher level dominion council that Enki was part of and other races were part of it too. So there are lots of alien races that are incarnating in bodies. Okay. And they can do that. So there's not just one type of us running around. There are aliens in our bodies all over this planet representing different factions and they're competing for dominance and resources. And we're, we're their soldiers, the pawns they put on the battlefield to fight their wars, right? We're the sacrificial lamb because we're the lowest consciousness level on this planet. Well, except for maybe snails. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's fascinating. And along with uh, everyone else awakening, it seems like the, our planet is, is also having some sort of awakening. On my channel, I, I follow Earth Changes. I report yeah. on everything <clears throat> I can find, and they, there's a lot of changes going on. Um, well, let's talk. this is going to coincide with this awakening? Absolutely. Well, listen, why do you think Thoth Quetzalcoatl had a countdown to a particular point in time that had, I, the, and the time that what well, the countdown at the end of it was that we arrived in their pyramid structure on the Zulkan calendar at universal consciousness. And I asked George Norrie on the coast to coast of this question, what do you think that means? And what was he counting down to? Okay. What, what is the trigger for this evolution of consciousness that he's describing here? And I think this is just basic science, Chris. We are sensitive to energetic frequencies. Okay. 
and gra- I mean, there's all these forces, there's gravity, there's nuclear forces, all the things that happen that we're sensitive to, you know, we're, we're, uh, a, we're a material form, but we're stitched together by energy. We're, we're essentially energy. Okay. Well, energy can n- neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be influenced by outside sources or electrical principles, if you will. So for instance, if you take a spherical body that has a hollow core that's been filled with some molten metal, well, guess what? When energy hits it, frequencies hit it, it causes a standing wave resonance that we call uh, the Schumann resonance. Okay? And it's simply a function of the geometry of the planet and, blah, 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 and the speed of light. Okay? It's really pretty simple. The circumference of the Earth and the speed of light. Well, you are no different in a sense. You're made of the same material. So if you take your body and you expose it to a microwave like you cook your food with, that energy will burn you because you're mostly water. Okay? That frequency is absorbed into water. Well, now let's think about something a little subtle. The, the sun radiates all energy that creates the electromagnetic spectrum that we regulate life on. All life is dependent on these frequencies from the sun to have form. Okay, there's no sun, you've got a dead planet pretty much. Okay. And no water, okay? But you can have sun and still have life, you know, in various forms. But that energy from the sun is key to all life. And, the, and so this, the fact that that was encoded in the Mayan calendar and they termed it in periods of suns, well, what were they talking about? So in their ball game, the Mayans uh, represented allegorically what happened when um, we reached this countdown point of universal consciousness, and it's a repeating cycle, right? their calendars repeating just like the Hindu cycles are that what is that event? Well, he told them what it was. The, the, our solar system goes through the dark rift. That's what they believed. Well, what's the dark rift? That's the galactic equator, the center of our equator. Okay. The equator uh, or the middle plane of our galaxy. Why? Because if you look at it, it looks like a spiral nebula nebula from Hubble telescope, right? And it's a spinning mass around a center that has little arms out of it that, Little planets are swinging around with it, and they are undulating up and down through the galactic center because the galaxy itself is wobbling slightly. And so as it wobbles, everything that's being drugged through it eventually wobbles back and through the galactic center. Well, that's where all the aggregated energy uh, happens to be, is at the galactic center. It It gets attracted there, right? And many bodies and gases and materials get attracted there. That's why if you look at it, it's not a sphere, it's a flat kind of nebula that's spinning with everything at the middle, essentially. And and right at the very middle is the strongest gradient force of this energy. And our solar system passes through that repeatedly every approximately 13,000 years. So they had established what they call a great year, which was the time period to transit from one end of that wobble to the other end. And that takes 25,920 years. Take half of that, that's the time when you're going to pass through the center. And this was encoded in the calendar. Because Thoth knew, Quetzalcoatl knew, that when our meat host with these latent circuits in it get exposed to that energy, whatever the frequencies are or different, or whatever happens to our sun as it passes through there, changes all life. Okay. So I did a show uh, called uh, Mind, Fifth Sun, and Ascension Timing. And I looked at the science of what the Mayans uh, were saying about this, and then also what we know from a modern science relative to what happens to the lifetime of a, su- of a star. Okay? And this is very similar, as above, so below. This is similar to you as well. Okay? Uh, the, the, life, the life of the star is very similar to the life of a human, if you look at the analogies. Well, in particular, if we take our sun, And it truly is at the place where it could be passing through the galactic center. Number one, you're going to get massive earth changes. Okay. Because of the different energies that are affecting the, the magnetism, the repulsion force, all the things that affect celestial mechanics are going to get perturbed as you go through this gradient field. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And it's possible that if there's enough fuel there, meaning gases and debris that get attracted or impact with the sun, that the sun's energy could change, meaning if it, get, if it got enough energy and material to continue its evolution, it could expand and go supernova and explode, right? Or it might burn up all its, 
it might burn up all its fuel and then uh, go and become a brown dwarf, okay? So that's gonna affect all the life as well, right? So now you got a dead sun and everything's gonna die. So that's possible as we go through the galactic center that we get changes to our sun. Okay, I see right now that we're supposed to be in a solar minimum every 11 years, right? Yeah. Well, there's some crazy stuff going on with earth changes right now and you have to have to ask yourself why. <laughs> Now, yeah. do you think there is anything to the uh, the Nibiru story or the Planet X story, <laughs> where it, it crosses and uh, causes turmoil and, and cataclysms? Well, if the if the Enuma if the Enuma Elish creation account story is true that the Sumerians gave us, then their planet and some of its moons or stars or constellations or satellites, whatever you want to call them were caught into our galaxy in their creation story such that it adapted the orbit around our inner sun along with the binary sun that became their sun for our sun. So in other words, uh, two suns decided to become binary twins and they got entrapped in that. Well, I think that happened through the passage at the galactic center where all this perturbation happens, okay? So I think those are very much correlated even though nobody talks about that. But I have several times said I believe that the thing that caused the Niburian constellation to become an intruder planet and go in retrograde orbit with our sun was exactly the passage through the, the galactic center. And so that was probably very important to many races knowing that through history. So does that, does that answer your question? So I think we're so doing the math, you know, ask yourself if that's true, are we in the age of Aquarius? Because Thoth said he was going to be the one that saw us through the dark age of Pisces and it was going to be here to bring in the new age of, of light, enlightenment for humanity, which we've never experienced. Maybe we got a little bit of it in Atlantis if some humans were there, but I don't think, I don't think we've ever been exposed to a philosopher king type of living experience where we weren't slaves. So do you see us going through a period of great turmoil before we can actually get to the point where we are, you know, where we should be as humans? <clears throat> yeah, um, here's the crazy part. When you dig into the, deeply into the Hindu writings about the yuga cycles, they believe the same thing relative to human consciousness, waking up as a function of your position relative to the galactic center. Okay, and I specifically am talking about the holy science from Swami Yukeshwar, who was a student of Babaji, okay? And Babaji is <laughs> the bomb. Anyway, so they, they both agree that the galactic center seems to do something to human consciousness. Now ask that question that you just did one more time, but make sure I'll stay on track. Now, I mean, I, I, do you think that we're going to go through some great turmoil and cataclysms before we actually get to the point where we need to be as humans? Um, well, I think the, the earth is a, according to Errol in the Roswell alien interview is a prison planet that's been used as a printed planet for a very long time because it's a very unstable inner planet that gets perturbed by all kinds of things. It's too close to the sun <laughs> and it gets disturbed by the changes in the sun. So they, so they recognize that and always never and said, you know, that's one of the reasons we haven't made it anything at an outpost because it's, it's unstable. It's not a place where we want, <laughs> where we can survive. So, right. um, so I think changes are, are absolutely common on this planet. Whole, go whole global floods, uh, plate tectonics getting ripped apart, uh, you name it. And, that, and if you look at the history of the planet, we're starting to learn that. But that, it's, it's, a ch it's a changing place and it happens a lot. And right now, um, I believe that our approach to the galactic center is perturbing our, everything. And, and, we, and we don't know whether conditions on the earth would be survivable through a passage or not. Some, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, okay? Look at the end of the last ice age. That was what, about 13,000 years ago? Well, that was the last time we passed through the, the uh, galactic center, okay? And the, so the, when the far point of our solar system is away from the galactic center, uh, that's called the autumn equinox, okay? And at that point, we're talking about the Kali Yuga cycle from the Hindus. This is the darkest, most asleep place for humanity. And what's really interesting about that, and that would go from about 600 BC to about 680. It's about a 1200 year cycle. Well, it's funny that during that period is when we had all these 
mystics and saints <laughs> incarnated in the earth, including Jesus and Buddha and Confucius and blah, blah, blah. All these people were in during that period. We were supposed to be the darkest yuga cycle, right? Well, who, who had a hand in doing that, making sure that mystics and sages were showing up in a time of the darkest part of human, human experience, <laughs> right? Yeah. So as you proceed through the wheel, as you reach the uh, spring equinox, which is where Westerners reference the galactic center, because that's the side that's closest to the GCR, the galactic center. Well, just from an energetic standpoint, being closer, you're going you're gonna to get blasted earlier than if you're farther away. But in the Hindu tradition, they take into account the binary sun's position relative to our sun and the galactic center and what that effect has on human consciousness. This is kind of like astrology, looking at the angles of this and the resultant energy of what it does, right? Well, they, right. Said, they said basically that's why we look at the fall equinox um, for the relationship to the galactic center. Uh, and we're in the Dwarpa cycle right now that at last 2,400 years. And then the next cycle lasts 3,600. And then, then the last one, the Satya Yuga lasts 4,800. Okay. So each one is, there's one, two, three, four cycles. And each one is a function of 1,200 years. Okay. And then they have aspects or windows at the beginning and the end of those cycles relative to where you are and what happens to human consciousness. So this was a little different than what the Mayans wrote in the Zulkan calendar in the, the nine rows of consciousness evolution versus what the Hindus were being taught. But it turns out they were being taught by the same being. That's the amazing part. <laughs> yeah, so, it is. Yeah, so um, I think, I think all, all is possible here right now. I mean, including... Um, a global flood, um, sudden shaking of the earth in a response to the galactic gradient if we we're passing through something, an impact with some, some debris. Look at all the debris that's showing up coming. Oh, these asteroids are coming in, and we're seeing them all the time now. Well, we're in the galactic center where all the debris is, okay? And so we should expect to see a lot more, right? <laughs> yeah, and the cosmic rays and then the energy that we're passing through as well. Exactly. And the, the part that's important to us is as – eternal beings have a material experience what is this energy doing to us relative to our consciousness well you're seeing that i think and this is the key of those latent circuits is the last circuit according to timothy leary and i wrote about this in my book was an energetic trigger this is the key chris it was an energetic trigger that could reprogram all your other circuits when that happened now who did that I'm telling you, I know who did that. And that's in the Atrahasis, and that was Enki and his son, Nengshida, who set us up to make sure that we could awaken in the window when the energy is there. If all else fails, and the Demiurgus system is so strong that you can't find your way back to the source, here's a window when this happens, that if you're still incarnate in a body on this planet, you will wake up. That's universal consciousness, and that is happening, and has ha been happening since the countdown to the end of the Mayan fifth sun. Even though everybody poo-pooed it and said, oh, nothing happened. Uh, we didn't all die. That was all a psyop, right? That whole 2012 thing. It was a psyop because they, people, they didn't want them to know what the truth was. Universal consciousness is the truth, and, and, it can't, and it's not something you can tuck away as a demiurgus beat-down slave system like we have right now that could keep it in a lid on it. They've tried. You control the media, you can right, control it. But once an idea is out, it can't be stopped, especially in a modern era like this. So right. That's happening, and you and I are part of that. And I think this is going to be a great way to close out. we got a few more minutes. I'd like you to, to talk about some of the ways that we may be able to help access our higher consciousness as we move towards this galactic center. Well, that's a good question, and it's different for every person because every person's path is a pathless land. So how do you distinguish yourself from your not-self? First of all, you have to have the concept in your mind that you are more than meat. Okay? The energy matters, and where that junction of energy meets in your body is where the finite meets the infinite, and that's where you're going to discover your connection back to the true source of all, which we call God, Okay, this creative force that whose energy animates us all, okay? And, it, and it's, uh, it's kind of a game of, you know, your higher self because of the influences through culture and your perceptions, your skewed perception prison plays hide and seek with you your whole life, okay? 
So until you are at the place where you realize you've got to distinguish yourself from your not self, that means find out what energetically makes you tick. And there's a simple way to start this. Okay, to be real basic here, when you put something in your mouth and you eat it and it makes you feel a certain way, makes you feel bad, you don't do it. Makes you feel good, you do it. Okay, especially if the long-term effects are healthy, not short-term satiation with a sugar fix or something like that. I'm not talking about satiating your desires. I'm talking about true assessment of cause and effect. Okay, so if I put something in my body and it makes me feel bad, like alcohol, and I'm blurry in the head and I can't seek wisdom because I'm always in a stupor, well, that stands between me and my higher self, my higher aspect of myself that could be sentient and clear-headed and put pieces together, okay? So what I'm telling you is if you just pay attention to how something makes you feel, not in the short term, like a satiated desire, like good food or good sex or something or good smoke, not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the energetic sense of yourself, a well-being sense where you know that when you're doing the right thing internally, your intuition that it's right for you it may not be right for another person. Okay? So whatever those things are that are standing between you experiencing yourself as a higher energetic being, uh, and I don't care if that means cutting out meat, whatever, do it for a while, do it for two weeks, okay, smoking, whatever you're doing that's, is, that may be affecting your energy, okay, and this, now the, the hard part about this is, Chris, it's in the water, it's in the air, it's everywhere, like you said, it's yeah. been designed to keep you asleep, so you, you're going to have to work your butt off, okay, you've got to make this so important that it's more important than watching TV or football or whatever it is you're doing, and there can't be responsibilities in the way for you deciding, I'm going to take responsibility for finding out what this is, okay, and there are methods that people use, and I don't want people to get caught up in techniques, okay, because it may not work for someone else. The bottom line is how do you experience yourself as your not self? How do you experience your energy? How do you do that? Well, we have historical ways that people do that. Everything from transmitting a frequency from one person to the other through Ayurvedics, okay? You hit a tuning fork and you change the frequency. Okay, so let's talk about science a little bit, brain waves. One way to change your perception of yourself and experience a higher sense of yourself is to um, change your brain waves. Okay? How do you, because we know from delta, theta, alpha, and beta, you have different experiences and perceptions in those different brain wave states. So, meditation allows people to reach different brain wave states. A handheld mind modulator that costs a couple hundred dollars that'll change your brain waves through entrainment, you can experience it that way too. You can listen to YouTube uh, binaural audio beats at various frequencies. See how that makes you feel. You've got to start distinguishing between things. Distinguishment means you're, com you're not judging, but you're comparing, right? If I drink this and it makes me feel like, that, oh, I can't do it. But if I do this, wow, I eat quinoa or something. Wow, all of a sudden I just have this clear. Keep paying attention to that, of what makes your internal sense of energy feel better. If it's yoga for you, good. Yoga. If it's meditating, good. If it's structural integration, and these ones I all I recommend, okay, that changes your relationship to gravity. And for me, Chris, that was one of the biggest ones. I was so asleep in my body from all the damage, I couldn't have a relationship with higher energy. Right. Well, I, I, I take that back. When I was young, I was having out-of-body experiences over and over and over, and I didn't know what was happening, why that was happening. But I realized it wasn't happening to everybody like it was to me. And after reading Robert Monroe's book, Journeys of the Body, I realized, of course, I'm an eternal energy being and this is a meat host. It was obvious to me because it happened so many. It's not to people who haven't had that experience. Okay? People who've had near-death experiences in the hospital, they, they realize this. Okay, So then they make a, a 180 turn and they realize that all these things I've done in the material world, are just meaningless. What I have to focus on is my character qualities and my long-term evolutionary process in this game if I want to really get back to the closest place with the source. Okay? And I'm not saying you've got to be an ascetic and go live in a cave and all that. Those are methods that people have used. Okay? And uh, there's some really excellent uh, demonstrations of what can be done to wake a person up. First of all, if you go back to Timothy Leary, the hippie from the 60s, the professor, right? <laughs> he said, right. 
he said it really simply. You got to drop out. He was telling the people the same thing. You got to drop out, turn off, tune in and turn on. You got to drop out of what the culture is doing because that's what's controlling your brain software. Okay. If you're exposing yourself to culture in any way, shape or form, they're, they're programming your brain software, period. And, and then to turn on is to turn on to your internal, what makes you happy, what drives you, what's your inspiration, okay? And as long as those desires are leading to your higher expression where you're finding your passion and sharing it with your fellow beings so that it's edifying them, you're on the right path. And that path will lead you to ultimately all of us are predestined to reach enlightenment. It may take many, many incarnations and lifetimes. Yeah. But we're all at a different place in that process, a cumulative spiritual mass that may allow a whole bunch of people right now to wake up, which is what we're seeing. So, um, I, you know, breath work is absolutely Im brilliantly important when you understand the electrical body. For instance, in yoga, there's a tradition of the Ida and Pingala nadis in your nose, which is, turns out from a structural standpoint is where your sphenopalatine ganglia, a ganglia is a nerve complex. And those places, those nerve complexes up and down your spine, we call them chakras. Those are places where energy is having an experience or a conduit inside of you. This is where you're the, uh, I talked about meat modems, okay? A modem is a modulator and a receiver. In the receive side, of interacting with the electromagnetic spectrum, you have a construct in you that can do that, and that's your chakra. So people talk about, well, how do you have a chakra awakening kundalini experience, okay? Well, that just simply means that you've taken uh, responsibility for that energy in your body, you release it from the lowest ganglion of impar in your tailbone, and all of a sudden it starts traveling up and trying to open up all the other ones so it can have a full experience with you. It's like um, a match finding dry paper the truth wants to find meat hosts that are going to express itself in full truth and universal consciousness. So when you volunteer and take responsibility for your internal energy and you decide that, your whole life's going to change and your mission's going to change. Okay. So um, looking into Kriya Yoga, how to breathe to activate your energy. There's, there's ways you can breathe in five breaths, Chris, playing with your energy that can knock you on the floor, you'll pass out. It's so strong if you know what you're doing, okay? So there, these, are, these are transient methods to get to experience your higher consciousness. But once you trigger that process, it continues on its own, okay? And each chakra as it opens up represents a new level of consciousness and perception for you in this simulation game. Okay. Very well said, yeah. And I, I know we're meant for so much more and there's just so many physical things that hold people back. But if they could just get past that, make themselves better, it'd make the world better. Yeah. And, uh, Gerald, that was awesome. For the last couple minutes, do you have anything interesting coming up for you that you'd like to talk about before we leave? <laughs> well, based on my first book, uh, The Anunnaki and Nibiru, when I wrote it, uh, I was approached by Hollywood. Hey, this story's got to get told. The true story of humanity. It does have to get told. We're telling it like this, but not for the masses, right? In all the different languages. Yeah. And so uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a screenplay to try to tell that story in an entertaining but accurately, accurate way titled Odyssey Key. And uh, it's kind of been published for about a year now. And uh, through that process of realizing, hey, you know, you could spend hundreds of millions of dollars raising the, the team that's required to tell a story like this in a movie that's controlled by the Demiurgus forces that ain't gonna happen, right? So I was in a bit of a quandary. So I started animating and learning to try to tell the story myself, even though you know I'm, I'm a total hack and I just started about a year ago. But through that process, um, I, got a, I got inspired to keep going. And so uh, my uh, animation, game developing skills, all those kind of nerdy things that I used to do as an engineer, they've come back and it looks like they might find a way to get the story told one way or another. So I'm pretty happy about that, actually. <laughs> no, and I've seen your animation. It's really awesome. I mean, I, I know you say you just started, but that's really good for, for just starting, you know? Yeah, and, well, <laughs> it's, it's a hard gig, but, you know, if you watch what's happening with digital avatars and things, the technology has gotten so good that they can animate one now real time, and you can't even tell it's not a real human. So it's like, oh, yeah. Ooh, I'll bet you Hollywood's kind of nervous about what's going on with that. I'm sorry, I was kind of far away from the mic there but yeah so that's on my heart um 
I, I just see every day as an opportunity to share the passion and the map that I've had with my fellow beings. I, I don't want anybody to hear me say that I have the truth because uh, I'm not saying that. I'm only sharing my experience and the map that got me to where I'm at right now with everyone else. And I think that's the most we can do to add to the human dialogue on the wall is do that. And so I can't do it forever. I'm not going to be around forever, but putting it into books and, and videos and all the other things I've done, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm working toward the right goal, but uh, I have no ego attachment to it. I'm just here like everyone else participating in this morass, calling it what I see it, but I want to go to a higher place just like everyone else. But I'm not talking about ascension to escape. You're here to have a material experience, to evolve yourself, to reach a place where you're enlightened and you can stay or leave to another dimension. But until then, there's no way to graduate other than the only path that was designed for your soul. And that path is the same path you fell from the top of the mountain at universal consciousness down to the material wallowings of this simulator. Until you've turned around and started crawling back up that mountain, um, there's, there's no one that can wake you up. It's up to you. So we're not here to wake anyone else up. But the people that are on the mountain that are crawling back to the source with us, uh, we're just sharing the little tidbits that we know that got us from one ravine, wadi, where we couldn't see <laughs> to the next one on the ascension path. So. Very good. Very well said. And I'm so glad they let us actually finish tonight. Out of the almost two hours we're here, I feel like we just barely scratched the surface of the stuff we could talk about. So we're going to have to have you back on definitely. Okay. And Jared, thanks for coming on. That was very awesome. And we'll talk to you later. Okay, brother. You be good and uh, enjoy yourself and we'll catch up later. Talk. Okay. Very talk. good.